Hello and welcome back to the Mets Matters Podcast, episode 11. I'm Justin Freed. And I'm Josh Finkelstein. And we're back. We're no longer in Cortland, but we are back. We're in the comfort of my own uh, bedroom. There's a little ripped up Johan Santana poster. It's, Chukasa es su casa for today. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we didn't discuss it saying that. Okay, <laughs> yes. My casa is your casa for, for this for this episode. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're back. We've been gone for two weeks. Uh, this chair is squeaky. I realize that. This is going to be annoying. But, uh, yeah, we are Just back. Don't move. Okay. We're back after two weeks. Um, we took a little bit of a break last week just to, you know, get acquainted and stuff, get back to the normal, you know, living at home stuff, back with our parents and, you know, because we're adults. Uh, but, yeah, so since we since we last talked, I think it was right after the Red Series, so the Mets split with the Phillies, split with the Blue Jays, swept the Arizona Diamondbacks, which was very surprising, although the Diamondbacks were a little bit cold at the time. And then, of course, um, in true Mets fashion, we lost two of three to the Marlins. So that was nice. We are recording this on Friday the 25th, May 25th, I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. And the Mets just defeated the Brewers last night, 5 nothing. So, yeah, some a lot of stuff to discuss. We'll jump right into it, I guess. Um, first, we'll discuss the lineup struggles. I guess we can start talking about that because that is the most pressing need. Um, Josh, what are your thoughts on, I guess, the lineup? I mean, uh, I, I, it's not really good I thoughts. I mean, but. well... To start off, Michael Conforto actually looks like he's kind of breaking out of, out of his slump. He still had some bad games here and there. But overall, I think he's hitting 300 over the last two weeks, I think. So, I mean, he's not going to be perfect. It's going to take some time. But I think he is going to get out of it eventually. Jay Bruce has been an absolute nightmare uh, offensively this, thus far. And we'll talk about it later, but one player – is making us question whether that was really a good decision, even re-signing him at this point. Um, first base, Gonzalez has actually been one of our better hitters for the month. He's hitting 315, yeah. despite being the guy that almost everyone points to for release. I don't think most Jose people, Reyes is a nightmare. I think most people expect Gonzalez to be out of the lineup. By yeah. Point, but Jose Reyes like, has been a nightmare. Yeah. Just simply. Yes, he has. He's terrible. <laughs> Uh, the offense was so bad they signed Jose Batista to a minor Joey league, Bats. To, to a to a major league deal. He's made one start. He has four at bats, two yeah, sh- two strikeouts, I believe, in that span. Yeah, a yeah, double. I know he got a double his first. Yeah. Start. Um, he has Joey a walk bats. also. Uh, the catch Devin Mezzarocco offensively is better than anything we had at that position. All season, except for Plowacki and Darno. <laughs> it's hard, to, hard for anybody to be worse than Nito. Yeah. Not that Nito's bad, but he just can't hit. Yeah. And Lobotone. Yeah, well, now he's gone. Thanks. Yes. Was he officially gone? Oh, he's in triple. He, yeah. He's outright in triple A. Call so. back up Johnny Manel. That's what I want to see. You hungry? Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this was happening before. The, I think he's very hungry. Yeah, I'm really hungry right now. Yeah. But but if you're hearing some ambient sound in the background. Yeah. It's either the wind or Josh's stomach. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, go on. Anyways, uh, Rosario, I mean, basically only can hit in the ninth spot. His OBP is less than 30 points higher than his average, which really annoys less me than watching. Walmart Flores is hitting 290 against right-handers this year and Crazy. 170 off lefties. Reverse splits at its finest so, you know, right there. Baseball doesn't make sense. Yeah. Ever. Wilmer, I, <laughs> Wilmer has to play every day right now because we don't have a third baseman until Frazier gets back. Frazier should be Frazier and Cespedes should be getting back in the next couple weeks, though. So Unless you play they Batista. Will get, they could play Batista at third. But I don't want to see that. that. I don't want to see it. Let's, let's just stick with Flores. Honestly, he's not a good in the yeah. either. So. Cabrera's consistent. That, that's, a, that's a bright spot. That's good. Um... I mean that that's really the offense at that point. I mean I, it's not. It's been very underwhelming. They they scored 12 runs against Toronto in the first game of the homestand. They scored 17 runs the less the rest of the whole homestand, which was absolutely atrocious. They are averaging over the past uh, during that span after that 12 run game. They are averaging 2.4 runs per game. So, well, since well. Not counting the Milwaukee game. Actually. Since Cespedes but, went out, it, the lineup has not been the same. Even it's, with Cespedes, it wasn't good. I, it I wasn't mean, good, it, but it was still like Cespedes. Always, he was a little slow. He I mean, was yes. still, he was he getting the RBI. Well, we've had homers. We've seen the record with Cespedes. Exactly. With Cespedes and without, it's always been much better with Cespedes. But I mean, they the stat that annoys me more than any one of them, and we'll discuss the pitching later, the good side of it. But. Jacob DeGrom is five, the team is five and five when he starts a game. He is the NL ERA leader currently. That is absurd. It's awful. They it's they, awful. they were they he 
gave a seven inning shutout performance and he got a no decision for. I want to know what I, there's. I, I, you could definitely find a statistic somewhere, but I want to know what the average amount of runs scored during his <laughs> starts are because it's got to be less than three. Like it's it's crazy. The, another weird stat with that. Speaking of which, I, it is it is less than three. I'm pretty sure. I, I think nuts. I've seen it. It's nuts. The the more interesting stat I saw from that whole thing was their bullpen ERA is five runs higher when he pitches than it is any other pitcher. That's, not, that's just <laughs> they're, it's hard to even blame anybody for yeah. that. Well, the, the, that that stat I don't know if there's any correlation really. It's just like it's well, just the, the so familiar weird. Familiar save contributes that and so. Yeah, I mean familiar. You know the bull. I think I saw the bullpen ERA is seven point. 05 when Jacob DeGrom pitches, and it's 2.29 when anyone What's else in the rotation What's crazy about that goes. is he usually goes seven, eight innings. Well, that's so the thing. He, like, did, he doesn't give the bullpen much of a It's, uh, it's not like he's out at the fifth yeah. so that the bullpen is going to go four innings. No, he's, he goes seven innings. They actually pitch better with less rest, it seems. Again, baseball makes understand. no sense. Baseball makes no sense. I don't sometimes. understand. That, that stat... I, I take with a grain of salt, salt though, because I don't even understand how that one makes sense. It that, doesn't make sense. Like, the, like the hitting, it makes sense. It, you know, just like... Bad luck. They don't. Just maybe they don't. Line. They feel confident. They're not as like. They. I guess they don't feel the pressure to score. Maybe something like that. Well, yeah, they're thinking. Like, okay, we only need to score two. Yeah. Runs. Well, yeah. The offense sees that they're winning for most of the game because Jacob, Jacob Degrom has allowed one run in his last four starts, I believe. Crazy. Which, and yet he's. I think he has two wins. Yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah, hitting, maybe two wins. I'm not even sure if it's two. I think it's, it's one. It's nuts. That's yeah. Nuts. Well, yeah, we know how we know how bad and inconsistent the hitting's been. Cabrera has been contributing. As Drupal Cabrera has been yeah. a lone bright spot, but hitting three twenty. I think it was, it was last night's game. I think I heard. I think it was Keith Hernandez said it. If it reminded me, I don't. Know, I forget who said it. But if as Drupal Cabrera is the guy in your lineup, yes. I don't care like how good he's hitting right now. If he's the guy in your lineup, there's a problem there because he's not one. He's yeah. not keep this up. And two. It's a Drupal Cabrera. Like, I mean, it's, you need to have someone else. It's well, yeah. People need to step up, but I think that, like, I actually think his Drupal Cabrera might be able to sustain. Maybe not this, but I think he's gonna have a good year. Might, he might hit two eighty five. I mean, like, I mean he he's might. he's playing very well right now. He you is. know, like the stats actually show he's one of the best hitters in the league at the moment. I mean, he's he's Crazy. actually like eighth in a lot of somewhere in the top ten for a lot of categories right really now. Good. So he, but again, to expect that he'll do this the entire exactly. year, maybe a little and, unrealistic. And he needs some help. You need guys like Michael well, yeah. to step up because even if he's breaking out a little bit, like his OBP is good, yeah. but he needs to get hits. Yeah, he needs to start driving in runs and getting hits, and he hasn't been able to do that yes. so far. One guy though that has been stepping up, good and this way. is uh, is Brandon Nimmo, Brandon Nimmo. who. Out of the leadoff spot, has been announced as the team's everyday leadoff hitter, at least until Cespedes, Yoannis Cespedes returns, which we're going to get into in a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, after last night, went four for four with a tr- with a triple, two singles, and a double, and a walk. He's been on base each of his last eight plate appearances, which is That's insane. Crazy. He also had a home run uh, on Tuesday. Uh, no, when. Wednesday, Wednesday. He had a home run on Wednesday. Yes. Uh, yes. That was the one. I yes. I, I remember. Oh, see, it makes me so happy when Brandon Nemo gets like hits yeah. a home run or does anything good because he just, he thought he got the game winning home run. His it was just his smile. Yeah. His smile makes yeah, he's me so happy. His yeah. smile, it, like it's such a dopey, dopey yeah. smile, but it's it's great. It's great. And the bigger, the most interesting thing of this whole thing, Brandon Nemo officially qualified based off plate appearances. And he now leads the league in on base percentage ahead of guys like Mike Trout. Mookie Betts, 450 on base percentage. And his average moved up to 294 yesterday. Doesn't have the plate a lot of plate appearances like those guys do. Still has about Enough and, to qualify, though. and he has four triples, which is second in all of baseball. The leader has five, and he has double the amount of at bats it's as crazy. Brandon Nimmo. But Brandon Nimmo is second tied for second in triples. Leads the league in OBP and a 294 average to go along with it. I mean, the Mets, the Mets have been searching for their leadoff hitter for years now, and we yeah. might have finally found one with Brandon Nimmo. He, yeah, he uh, has to stay in the lineup. And again, I guess yes. we, can, we can kind of talk about that now. You know, he has to stay in the lineup. If Cespedes or when Cespedes comes back, Brandon Nimmo needs to find a way to be in the lineup. Whether that's meaning Jay Bruce sits or whatever you got to do. <laughs> Whether that means Jose yes. Batista gets no at bats, I don't care. Brandon Nemo needs to be in the lineup, and he needs to be at the top of the order. hundred percent. I mean, I, the, Brandon Nemo is an everyday player now. I'm convinced. Yes. I'm we're I'm done seeing this. You know, let's you know, let's see what he does in a limited role and see if he earns himself playing time. No, it, it, this is his job now. This is his job. Someone else is losing their job. Whether it be Michael Conforto, which I don't want to see personally, Jay Bruce, 
or you have to move Bruce to first. Whatever you have to do, Brandon Nimmo needs to play every day. He's the one guy on this team that is a catalyst and makes runs for everyone else. They don't. They will exactly. score at least a run per game less if Brandon Nimmo is not in the lineup. The guy's mm-hmm. a flat out on base on base machine. No matter what way you slice it, he 450 OBP. He gets on base half the. The amount of times he gets up, almost. I want to that, see. I want to see the stat for runs created because I don't. I don't know what it is for him, but it's got to be something. It's got to be. Really I think high. he's fourth on the team in runs currently. Yeah, fourth, and, like the, and, and he's fast too. I mean, yes. he's a, he brings a speed element that we don't currently have. It, other it's, than it's him. hustle too. It's, yeah. it's like he has good speed, but it's not just the raw speed. It's hustle. Like yeah. he's. I would say out of anybody on the team, he's the most likely to extend a single to a double. Oh, it's not even 100%. because like okay, he's the most fast, he's the fastest player or something like that. It's, no. no, it's like he just hustles. Like even the home run hurts I was talking about, put his head down immediately. Yeah, hits the home run, is not looking at it. Put his head down, starts sprinting to first base. Yeah, that's he, something you don't see from everybody. He brings an infectious attitude that he no does. one else has on the on this roster currently, and they need to they need Brandon Nimmo every single night. He is he's an everyday outfielder. Sandy Alderson, for all the flack he takes, and for you know, so he's he's not perfect with the minor league system by any means. Brandon Nemo has turned out to be by far his best draft pick of all to, of of all of them, and I'm going to explain why. I know Michael Conforto is the mm-hmm. easy one to point mm-hmm. to, but Michael Conforto was a consensus pick when they took that one. Michael okay. Conforto was not a out of the box thinking one. Brandon Nemo did not play high high school baseball, and they took a guy from Cheyenne, Wyoming. That had not played yeah. baseball because they saw some skill set. It took a while to come around, but they found themselves an everyday major league outfielder. And from everything I read online, whenever the Mets have discussed a trade for someone of significance, Brandon Nimmo is the first guy every team has asked for. There's a reason for yeah, that right now. Brandon Nimmo is not just someone that people think could be a decent baseball player. There are people who see elite on-base skills with this. On-base percentage is probably becoming the most valued stat of all on offensive ones in baseball, and Brandon Nimmo has a significant amount of value right now. Exactly. You know, The idea that they would have traded him for Andrew McCutcheon is looking like a, a complete joke right now. Andrew McCutcheon is hitting 237. I remember we were talking about that in the off season. Yeah. The off season, it's like, oh man, the Mets didn't trade Brandon Nimmo for McCutcheon, even with the, I believe he was offered for Josh Harris, or like they wanted yeah. him for Josh Harrison too. Like Mets fans are bashing uh, management and be like, oh Brandon Nimmo, you're not going to give a Brandon Nimmo for Andrew McCutcheon. It's like, yeah. well, be patient, and now look what we got. And yeah. I, I was in the, I was in, not bashing, but I was in the part that was like, okay, I would have done that trade. I would have traded Nimmo for I, back then. When I looked back on it, I told myself that maybe not for McCutcheon, but if you gave me McCutcheon and Harrison, I would have done it. Like, or if it, or even too. just Harrison, because Harrison had years of control left. Yeah. But you know what? I'm so glad well, I am wrong about that. You're a big Josh Harrison yeah. fan too. So. Yes. I'm so glad I am wrong about that. Brandon Nimmo right now, I would not trade for almost anyone. I, I'm, I'm not – listen, yeah. there are exceptions I'll like tell, the I'll, Mike Trouts and the Mike Trouts of the world. Trout. But if – let's say it takes that to get JT Real Muto – not an, I, I'm not doing it. I, I'm passing on it. I, I'm I, I'm honestly mm. passing on. It. I don't think Real Muto is enough for Brandon Nemo at this stage. How I many, actually, how many years of control does Real Muto have left? Three. Mm. I I wouldn't. I, I'm sorry. I you can, I don't know. I'd have there to are, there are cat the catcher position. Is, he's not a great defender first of all, and there's a lot of bad hitting catchers in baseball. You can survive without a bad hitting catcher. You can't survive without a leadoff hitter. I agree. And, and that, you and, know what? That's a fair point. And that and that's the realistic picture. And Nimmo has five years of control left on him, which and, is and, his, and he's a budding star. His not, clubhouse persona is, it is invaluable to the team yes. as well. I just if if Conforto can get back to hitting like we know Conforto can, yeah. And once Cespedes gets back, Cespedes Conforto Nimmo outfield, yeah. That's that's great. That's, that's an amazing. all-star outfield, and it's a lot younger than than we envisioned it being at one point. Who, who do you stick in right then, Nimmo? Um. Conforto, I think, is actually better defensively in center than Nimmo is. So I think I put Sorry. Nimmo on right, Cespedes in left. His arm isn't bad. And His Bruce, bad. I don't know what you do with Bruce anymore. I, I'm actually starting to get very curious because Gonzalez is not hitting that bad. And on top of it, the other factor that they really need to consider with this, maybe two guys, two to three guys are going to have to go in this whole shuffle because you really are talking about four first base candidates. Jay Bruce, Adrian Gonzalez, Dominic Smith, mm-hmm. who has learned to play the outfield. They are getting I so. Like that. They are I getting like so. That. I I don't think it's going to work. Though. I don't think I don't it's going to either, but term. I like that they're doing that. And they have Peter Alonso, who is the fastest rising prospect, one of the more fasting rising prospects in the game right now. He's leading the Eastern League. Fasting in, rising. Well, 
Fast rising. Yeah, bad bad wording on that. Okay. Um. Yeah. Fasting rising. I swear I'm a writer. You're, but... you're fasting right now. That's why you're so hungry. Yeah. I was just thinking about food. <laughs> that's yeah, that's, that's why I was saying that. Um. But you are gonna have a real real issue there because one of Smith or Alonso is the first baseman of the future. Bruce and Gonzalez are not your first baseman of the future. I highly doubt anyone no. thinks that. I don't know. I hope no one Bruce that. may be only because he's under contract for another two years after this one. You ha- you're you going to have to put him somewhere. But at the same time, Peter Alonso right now is proving to be a can't-miss power bat. And Dominic Smith was still the guy you wanted and thought was the first baseman of the future only a year ago, and he was a first-round pick. So there's no way you're giving up on both of these guys. And one of them, one of those two has to go. I, I'm pretty convinced that one of those two will be traded within the next year. It, for de- probably in a deal, if they try to buy this year, one of those two will be traded. Because that those two are both valuable pieces that can get you something big. Now, when we talk about Gonzalez and Bruce, th- this is the tricky formula with this. You could theoretically argue that both Alonzo and Smith have to go. Because of Bruce's mm-hmm. presence, if you're going to play Nimmo every day. That being said, I would not do that. I would go with one of Smith or Alonzo long term. I, I Bruce maybe for the temporary makes sense, but one of those two has to go. Gonzalez is a really tricky situation because the thing with well, it's not it's not end of the world tricky, but it's, it's almost tricky. A good thing. It's almost a little it, bit it's, good it's, thing. it's a good situation yeah. and a bad one because and this is this is probably actually the most fearful situation with Gonzalez that you could have found because he's not that great. But at the same time, he's not bad enough to just release. He's not great. Like he's play, he's hitting like 265 with five homers and 20 RBIs. That's okay. And but he has like a negative 0.2 WAR. Mm. I mean, it's not it's not enough. He's he's average. But but when you have three other candidates that potentially could be better than him, it makes it tricky because he's not really deserving of a release, but at the same time, he might just have to get it at some point just because of this. I mean, at that point, you could just use him as a bench player, as a pinch hitter. I mean, yeah, but uh, do you want to pinch hit? Do you want to get. Right now, they're playing with a four man bench, first of all. And even if they went to a five man, do you really want to dedicate two spots of the roster to first baseman? That, yeah, that's fair. Unless, it, unless if the it. other one is Bruce. Well, so because if you Bruce, play Bruce at first. If that's, if that's how you view that, if you're going to put Bruce on it, then I guess you can probably survive with but it. But at because, the same time, do you really want Bruce in the lineup over Gonzalez? I don't know. If right they, now, no, that's it's I, I honestly – I, I actually like Gonzalez more. I feel like Gonzalez is much more patient up there. I agree. He's mu- – he drives in runs in clutch situations. I like. He has like more power him. than Bruce. I mean, is not he has power twenty him. RBIs. It's yeah. nothing to sniff at. That Bruce, puts him on pace for about you know seventy five to eighty. Bruce which, has what two or three home runs? He has three homers it's and like, like eleven RBIs. Yeah, that's and awesome. he's hitting two thirty. And he's striking out a lot. He. I mean, listen, Bruce. One of the, Bruce, I don't think age is age is not an issue for Bruce really yet. Yeah. So I'm. I'm not going to sit here and think that Jay Bruce is washed up. Gonzalez is more likely to be washed up than well, he Gonzalez is. is Gonzalez is washed up. Well, he is washed up. I don't care if he's hitting 260 right and he's washed up. I wouldn't say washed up. I'd say more he's a certainly a shell of himself. A shell that's, what I, that's what I more mean. I, I would say that. I mean, I guess washed up comparative to what he was. Yes. He's not like, to, I guess he's – He used to be a top five first baseman. Now he's like a bottom, bottom of the – and yeah. bottom of the league starting. He can still contribute, but it's certainly nowhere near yeah. the level of what it used to be. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think this – they are eventually – this is going to be a really tough decision though because the – here's here's a factor you have to consider. If you're going to – you're going to have to trade one of those two of Smith and Alonzo. If you get into that situation, you need to know which one is actually the first base in the future. You don't want to be the team – that trades away the one who becomes good. Like, yeah, and right. and the thing is, the only way you're going to find out is if one of them moves up. Don't be the Blue Jays with Noah Syndergaard. Yeah. <laughs> Move, you know, they're going to have to see Dominic Smith on the Major League roster. And until that yeah. hap- happens, it's going to be very difficult to judge because you're basically just making an opinion of which one you like better. And and judging from the Mets farm system ranking, they are not good at deciding that. No. So the the fact is, is they 
are in a predicament where they need to figure out what they have. They need to take inventory at the first base position. It's odd because they're oh, they're I for all, really they really are a win now team. Kind of they're looking towards the future, but they don't have a deep enough farm system to not be win now. Like their their farm system isn't deep enough to to justify them being in a rebuilding phase or at least staying neutral. Yeah. They're win now. So they're trying to win games right now, but they're also trying to assess their future at first base, which is tough because you know, if you call up Dominic Smith or even Peter Alonso at some point this year, there's no guarantee that they're going to be any more productive than, say, Gonzalez or Bruce's right now. And if they're trying to win, then trying to like then trying to figure out your future isn't the best way to do that. It's it's a weird kind yeah. of yeah. Well, I was talking about this uh, with uh, one of my friends the other day, and we were saying that w- one of the issues right now with this team is well, with this organization in general. Have you ever noticed that they with their farm system is they tend to do two things. One, overvalue their prospects because they end up not producing yeah. at the major league level a lot of the time. And they it's good in the sense that the teams trade for them because they think they're good because of the way we talk about them. But it's bad in the sense that when the ones we keep usually end up not being that good. And Rosario was expected to be a generational talent. He comes up and I mean, I'm not going to shut like, the door on him. Sl- I'm not shutting the door, but it's He's like, behind the A-ball of what we thought he was going to yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. Like, people yeah. thought he was going to be instant contributor like. Really the defense isn't even that great. It's not. Which is, which is not. something There's I'm a little... There's a five-tool player. We're not seeing any of those tools, really, yeah. at an elite level. Yeah, I'm seeing average at any at exactly. every one of them, but for the most part. Um, and he's swinging at everything. Yeah, he has no plate discipline, which is something that you develop in the minor leagues, which he apparently didn't. Yeah. Um, that being said, the other thing that the Mets have a, a propensity for doing is developing players at one position and then ign- having barren wasteland of talent at every other position. You we saw that in tw- the you know early 2010s point with pitchers. They had a lot oh, yeah. of pitchers and it, pitchers is the one area where you want a lot of that because it's there's multiple pitcher spots and you can move them to the bullpen worst case scenario. Then it became shortstops. They had Rosario, they had they have Jimenez currently in the minors. They had they, they had Louis Carpio, who never became yeah. anything. But the yeah. point is they had a lot of them. Luis then, Guillorme. Yeah, Luis Guillorme <laughs> is another one, which they have currently. Phil but Evans. <laughs> Phil Evans, people thought, was going to be decent. Oh, uh, uh, Sakini. 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 Sakini, another, another example. One. Then the next thing became relief pitchers, which we currently still have uh, yeah. a, a lot of depth at. And now it's first baseman. We have too many first base prospects. Not only do we have Smith and Alonzo, but we also have another first base prospect who stand, stood out this year, Jeremy Vasquez in single A. So it's an and the thing with first base that is separates that that position from all the other ones in the in the negativity towards of from me on that. First base men are not the most athletic people, and therefore you have three first base prospects. None of which that can move around the diamond. Yeah, they're not versatile. So basically you are in a situation where you are going to have to pick which one is your future and which one is not and trade the, the one that's That's not. a good point. If you have those shortstop prospects, you can yeah. move them around. You can play shortstop them in second, you can play them in third. Outfield, some of them move Exactly, through. even move them to the outfield. But yeah. first base, you're not going to do that. You're not gonna, Dominic Smith, even though he's trying to play the outfield. That's not that, a long-term that, thing. If that can work, great. Yeah. But if it does, like, uh, there's a good chance it Well, doesn't. here's the thing. It, it And this is the issue for me with Smith, too, and with the outfield. The outfield yeah. happens to be our exactly. other issue Where that we have exactly. a logjam. Brandon Nimmo is we we are we just had to have a, a segment to talk about Brandon Nimmo needing to play every day once once Cespedes comes back because they don't have room for that. So how so moving Smith to the outfield isn't going to decrease that logjam any better. It might help in the minors that you can move Alonzo to Triple A, but you can't. But Smith and a Al- but Smith and Alonzo cannot play for the same team at the same time long term. Let's just play Dom Smith at second base. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lefty, see what he can do lefty second base. Exactly. Oh, it work. Yeah. It actually, can does never. I mean, unless if you want to make Peter Alonso your third baseman of the future, this is not going to. I have no uh, idea which, what his arm is like or his mobility. Uh, there. Well, they he only just became a decent first baseman this year, so I mean that, that's. Defensively has been is his issue, while Smith's defense has been lauded by many. I mean, at times. when he came up, it wasn't that great though. It was good, but it wasn't. He also was came, came into came up overweight, yeah, you're right. and now he's forty pounds lighter. So I'm not gonna he's forty pounds. Is that much I he know? lost an extra seven pounds when he got to Triple A. He's losing weight now, which I which honestly I'm not ready to give him on, on Smith because of that. I want to give him a shot. I, I could see him being a James Loney 
like a guy who can hit 290 but is not going to hit. Well, the question. Like well, months. here's the thing, and that there's a negative association that gets put on James Loney, but he, when he was good. James yeah, Loney was a very good first base. He's an all-star. I, see, I think Dominic Smith could be much in the sense of like a Sean Casey. That's I fair. think that's I before. think that's the type of mold you if you if that's what you, Dominic Smith could be your Sean Casey. Casey was a little more successful than Loney. The arguably had a yeah. little more power. Well, yeah, Sean Casey's a better version of James Loney. Sean Casey hit 300 every year. Yeah. Was a great defensive first baseman and could hit. 10 to 15. Yeah, year. Loney is almost Loney a hit like Casey. five homers and was a solid defender, but nothing spectacular. I thought he was, thought he was a pretty good defender. Earl, very early, he was a good yeah. defender. He well, became but, very the mediocre. He came to the Mets, he was mediocre. Yeah, yeah. Mediocre to bad, and they said he was With Tampa. And, and he was actually work. the second worst ranking first baseman on the team, despite at his stats that. not looking that bad. On paper. I remember when he was going when he was with the Dodgers, he was hitting like 12, 15 homers a year at like at his max point, hitting yeah. like 295, 300. That was prime James. Yeah. Lane. He also didn't have a he didn't know how to get on base too. Sean Casey could walk a ton, and Smith does actually too. He so does. that's why I think Casey. Well, might it's be interesting more that here. Smith has to play discipline, but Rosario doesn't. It's it's interesting that kind of the same people develop them, but you know, no it's able to develop more. it's actually kind of interesting. It seems from my from what I've seen in the past. It seems like the guys who have more plate discipline are usually the ones who strike out more as well. It's very weird. Yeah. I've started to – Nimmo strikes out once every four plate appearances despite the fact he has the best – Well, I mean you look at someone like Mark Reynolds. Like it's another, yeah. Like, I mean, I mean no. I mean there, there are some of them that, that break the rule. Well, but Reynolds, I've noticed that a lot of the people who are like – you know, Rosario is a slap hitter. The slap hitters, their OBP is usually a lot lower. The, like D Gordon has hits three fifteen. I think his OBP is three forty. Well, because they swing at a lot of stuff, and yeah. they can hit stuff out of the strike zone. Yeah, you know? yeah, and which the, is why sometimes they'll miss. But yeah. they, they'll swing at the stuff out of the strike zone because they can hit it because they're not trying. Well, that's to the thing. Yeah. Well, the thing is that I Brandon Nimmo has really taught me the thing about the strikeouts because he he strikes out twenty five percent of the time. But his OBP is but his OBP is four fifty, <laughs> and he's a good player. I'm not I, like he's flat out a good player. He gets on base. And he's an everyday player, and that, the reason for that is he probably looks to take, looks to make a strike a ball, and some he will have. That's something he will have to adjust to at some point, because. But in terms of, I I would take that player over the guy who's a, you know, a slap hitter and is gonna not get on base. I'd rather have that every day of the week. I just realized we had like a 10, 15 minute discussion yeah. on the yeah. first base situation yes. and Brandon Nimmo and everything. We should talk about pitching really yes. quick before we go. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, like, as we, I guess this is a good segue. You know, we had some yes. good stuff with Brandon Nimmo. Let's talk about good stuff with pitching. Over the past week and a week and a half or so, the starting pitching has been really good. Except for Zach Wheeler. Except for Wheeler against had Toronto. One bad start. His last start was actually good. Runs. I'm a little concerned about Wheeler, but Matt's has seemed like he turned yeah. around. Vargas. Finally put together a good start. Jason Vargas yes. finally put together a good start. Hopefully that is the sign yes. of things to come. He he looked much more crisp in his last start. He exactly. had his, his his stuff was in the strike zone. He took two weeks off. I'm hoping that maybe that was a mental clearance for him. Hopefully. He and maybe he can you know pitching getting a five inning shutout probably gave him some confidence back, yeah. which he probably desperately Shit. needed at this point. So I'm hoping that that can be something he can catapult his his Mets career with his second coming of his Mets career with. Because considering we're paying him eight million this year and eight million next year, we kind of need that contract to work out a little. Well, he just bit. had his best start as a Met. Yeah, in either stand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only five innings, so I'm still a little cautious. You know, maybe hope, yeah. hopefully. And it was the Marlins lineup, which ranks worst in all of baseball. Exactly. So, yeah. but I mean, honestly, the pitching was bad too. We couldn't hit yeah. them. So. <laughs> but at the same time, I I'm more what I saw from Vargas, I liked, which is something I, I couldn't have said. From the first three starts, absolutely that we saw. agreed. It's still early, but hopefully, like you said, this gives him a confidence boost. Yeah, and we know uh, we already talked about Degrom and how great he's been. We don't think we need to talk about that. That's not even a discussion. Be- best pitcher in baseball right now in, in the NL. Well, in the NL, in the NL, Verlander's up there right yeah. now still too. Him and Scherzer are the two sure, best sir. in the NL yes. at the moment. Yeah, Kershaw's hurt, yeah. so yeah. so it's those two. That's fair. Uh, and then Syndergaard is good. Syndergaard's finally going more than five innings now, which yeah. is a good, which is a good. Two plus. nine one ERA despite his issues this year. You know, like with Syndergaard, the way I look at it is for his, he he does he could be a lot better right now. He's he's ha- he's pitched worse than I would have liked, only because he's not getting the innings and he's his pitch counts are getting high, and people are fouling off a lot of pitches off him. But let's 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 some- put the scope on Noah Syndergaard a little yeah. bit. He. 
We are nitpicking in comparison to every other pitcher on this team. Noah Syndergaard is much better than any other pitcher besides Jake, not named Jacob Degrom on this roster. Absolutely. It, so like and he's an ace on yes. half the teams in the league. Yes, exactly. So half, maybe more than that. Probably I mean more that. Than half. I mean that Noah Syndergaard is. We we are fortunate to be able to call him a number two. Most teams yes. cannot do not have that luxury of you, of saying that they're number one. And I will still contend we might not have the best pitcher in the league from either Syndergaard or Degrom, but I think we have the best one two of anyone in the league. Be, and they comp, I, they complement each other so well because uh, Degrom yes. is such a knowledgeable pitcher and he's just. Like he doesn't have a, like the most amazing stuff in the league. It's Syndergaard, still pretty good. It's still really like if we're saying 90, that, 97, 98. Comparing him just to Syndergaard, yeah. who very well might have the best stuff in the league, top five stuff in the league. Yes, I, I would easily say his that. ninety three mile an hour wipeout slider. I mean that's and, yeah, and, and hitting ni- in ninety nine on fastballs. Yeah. Like even though it's a little his, his fastball is a little straight sometimes from like yes. but again we're nitpicking, but um yeah like they complement each other so well because Syndergaard has this blow away stuff. He'll go six innings, strike out ten guys in a start. Degrom yeah. will give you seven, eight innings and strike out maybe six, seven guys. They complement each other so well in just how they pitch. And if you yeah. go back to back, Degrom, Syndergaard, good well, luck. Well, I think I think also part of the reason Jason Vargas was brought in is because of the fact that everyone else in this rotation throws hard. That Jason good Vargas is it's a good change of pace, and if he really has figured it out, Jason Vargas could very well be the three that they need. And then Mats has been pitching well too, so I Mats could be well. Mats and Vargas can flip flop whatever order you want. I, th- I think that's a really good point with Vargas. Really, just really quick side note. That's like I think it speaks to the value of having a proven veteran in your rotation, especially nowadays when every prospect coming up can hit ninety five. Like it's yes. no prospect coming up that's a starting pitcher is, is not hitting like ninety four, ninety five, which is it's good, like because they got great stuff. Obviously, the control is a problem as well. But that means that you know, in the past, having that veteran presence was it was important, but it wasn't as important because now you have the veteran presence not only just to be a, you know guidance and a leader, but to just skills wise to be a change of pace guy who's going to yes. hit ninety ninety one. Exactly, it's very valuable. You know, a guy who's had the biggest resurgence this year, and I really wanted the Mets to sign him to a minor league deal in the offseason. Tolo Colon. <laughs> Well, that I mean, he has been a resurgence. Happy 45th, but, big sexy. Yes, but that's not who I was thinking. Okay. The guy who's having a resurgence this year, Jeremy Hellickson with the Washington Nationals. Is he, is he really doing that? Yes, 2.29 ERA oh with the Nationals on a, coming off a minor league deal. Yeah, like a five Jer- something. And you know sure. what Jeremy Hellickson has that these other guys don't? He has four four pitch mix in which he just stri- – he. He doesn't rely on a fastball like these other guys do. He, he has four pitch. pitches. He he locates, which is something that not every pitcher that most of the pitchers coming up right now are 95 and up velocity wise. It's actually refreshing to see guys like that 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 find a way to do it with four pitches. Seth Lugo, another example of that with the Mets. I mean that that's you know Gazelman yeah. same way, which is why they both probably both are having success. They're four pitch pitchers that can locate and mix and match with things, which and is, they come in right after starting pitchers exactly. who throw ninety five. Exactly, which is very interesting because you know the, every sport always evolves, and the game of baseball is evolving before our very eyes. Obviously, we see with home runs. I think we're going to see kind of maybe in the next decade or so we might see more pitchers actually not throwing as hard yes. as 95 because you know right now the trend is okay 95 and above have yeah. amazing stuff worry about control later i feel like teams are going to be more focused on well, getting those guys who can pitch and who have control well what we're, what i think we're going to tr- they're going to try to start doing soon which they haven't yet completely and it's difficult if you they're going to really need to find the perfect like poster boy for this type of thing what they're going to want to do at some point is try to find a way to not tip your mechanics but be the t- a type of pitcher that goes that can has a fastball that ranges in velocity, mm. like one that let's say you could throw your fastball at 91, or you could throw it 98 on occasion just to mess around with the hitters and make them surprised. Degrom does that. that yeah, I mean DeGrom he he that. occasionally does that himself. I mean Matt Harvey was doing that, but not for good reasons yeah, when he was doing it. It's just he did his arm was messed up. Although Cincinnati's been a nice. Uh, recovery no, period. We're not going to dedicate another episode. Yes, we're not, we're, not do, we're not doing it. But, um, <laughs> not point on is, wood that we don't do that again. Yes. Point, knock on wood segment. Yes. Point, point is that there's going to be a point, though, where I think they're, that's what they should be trying to do. Because if you can do that, if you can mess with a hitter so much that they don't know which fastball you're throwing, that would be incredible. I, I don't know if that's even possible. Again, I've, I did not advance very far 
baseball wise myself, so I don't know how easy that is to fix. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We can't all be Noah Syndergaard and Jacob Brown. Yeah. Some of us have to talk about them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some of (laughs) us where we are. Yeah. That that's where our roles are. Exactly. We can't play, so we talk. Yeah. Exactly. And exactly. But but I mean, I think that's something they definitely should try to do with some of these pitchers. But at the same time, you're right, though. I mean, the velocity, the fact is it's getting so normal. You know, they were, a lot of people think that or the reason people are fouling off Noah Syndergaard this year, everyone is throwing 99. Yeah. It's, it's everyone. Right. So they're used to it, and they're looking fastball now. They know he throws he throws his fastball low, low and in. So basically, they're sitting fastball on the and and on the off chance it's a slider. That's when they get they get struck out, and that's why he still has some success. But but the success level he was having might be unattainable for a little while, or until he adjust it to mix and match locations, which is what he really needs to do. But if he keeps throwing low and in fastballs, they are gonna hit that because of the fact they know he throws a fastball low and in, and everyone can hit 99 now. That is the, the headers are being trained to do that in the minor leagues, and they are being, and they are taking that and adjusting it to the major league level. Yeah, right. The future of baseball, the future of pitching in baseball. Yeah. I'd love to have a more in depth conversation about that yes. one time, but we are going over time. We are at 34 minutes. This is our longest podcast yet. Probably gonna go around 35, a little bit over. Yeah. Uh, but th- thank you guys if you watched the whole thing, if you listened, uh, we really appreciate it. Hopefully the the audio quality was okay because we don't yes. have a mic right now. We'll listen back. We're gonna try so, to get a mic. In yeah, the next we'll listen back, see how weeks. it sounded. If we need to get a mic, we can get a mic. Might talk to some people. Do what we gotta do, and hopefully the wind. You is. might talk to some people. I might, might talk to some. I'll talk to my friend Mike. Yeah. He, I I don't have a friend Mike that has a mic, but. You do have a friend, Mike. I do have a friend, Mike. Multiple friends named Mike. Yeah. But uh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully the uh, the ambient sound in the background, the wind uh, bouncing a ball, I think I heard that, or even Josh's stomach. Hopefully that wasn't too much to uh, distract you from our I think excellent... it stopped growling after that one time. You know, I was hungry. You, maybe you were hungry to talk about the Mets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I was hungry. It's got to be it. Uh, but yeah, anyway, yeah. thank you guys for watching, for listening. As always, this has been the Mets Madness Podcast. I've been Justin Green. I'm Josh Finkelstein. Thank you for watching.